thank you for being here. Um, so today I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I did using spectral data from the sun and how, uh, what methods I used and what observables I, did, I extracted and how they relate to each other and to the observed structure. I will mo mainly discuss about the magnesium two lines and but I also uh, in the Mostly when I will discuss the flaring activity, I will also discuss some re the relation with other features or um, emission lines. Is so, the microphone working? Hello. Is it, is it better? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. So I will start with a short description of what the magnesium two lines and how they behave and what their typical profiles profiles, and then th discuss how. The, what, the, what the naming convention, what observables we can do, extract from them, and what we can measure. I will discuss the, uh, these observables mainly in uh, quiet sun conditions. So I'll pick some very quiet sun, uh, sun data sets, and I will see how these different things uh, change with depending on the underlying structure, and if we can see if we inc can increase the contrast for instance for to s be able to see coronal holes in chromospheric emission which are rather impossible to see uh, then i will discuss how the profiles profiles change when i when uh, there's a flaring activity in the in the region and then finally i will finish with a peculiar coronal rain phenomena in the aftermath of a flare so you know, maybe very familiar with the, the solar spectrum. If we did not have an atmosphere, we'll have a, we'd, we'd have a lot of lines, even far into in, in the ultraviolet. But because of molecular absorptions of the um, elements in our uh, in our atmosphere, we cannot really see the ultraviolet part where the magnesium two lines are. So and a lot of other interesting lines. In order to be able to see these lines, we have to go. Uh, uh, as high above the ground as possible, where the um, ozone uh, absorption, so the magnesium two lines are in the absorption region of ozone, is less, so we need to go at least some tens of kilometers above the ground. Uh, in the past, this was done with using sounding rockets or um, balloon balloon born instruments and some measure interesting measurement with that, with that before we managed to send some things into space. Um, more recently, uh, IRIS, the Interface Region Imaging Spectrograph, was launched um, some five years ago, and since then has been observing the interface region, meaning the region between the photosphere and the corona, so the, chrom the chromosphere and the transition region, and trying to see how the energy is transporting from the photosphere up into the corona. Um, IRIS has uh, a context imager, so it will give you some information about the uh, surrounding structures that we are looking at, and also a slit that we're, uh, which is fed into uh, f three spectral ranges, one in the ultraviolet, which contains the magnesium, two, magnesium K lines, uh, H and K lines, and two in the far ultraviolet containing emission from carbon-2 and silicon-4, which are another very other very strong emission lines in the transition region. So, and Iris can have multiple observing modes. It can uh, fix the slit in a for certain position and look at a certain feature for a length of time. It can follow the feature with the solar rotation or it can just sit there and let the sun rotate under it. Or it can scan a region with the varying step between the two the consecutive slit positions. Um, depending on what you are interested in, you may be interested in having a very detailed information of a, of a certain position, so that would be a sit and stare observation, where the same, fe the same feature is tracked and observed in time. Or if you are interested, for instance, in flaring observations, you are interested to see the whole active region, so that for that you would want to scan the region and hope that the slit is close to the position where the flare is, when the flare happens, which is not always the case. Uh, so, in, uh, the in the iris spectral resolution, this is how the magnesium two lines, so if you look at in this uh, very low resolution, spectral resolution spectra, you see that the magnesium lines are in a deep absorption feature, absorption region, and they have broad wings and the center. Uh, we have two peaks, uh, which are named K and H, uh, after the 
similarly similar lines of the course the course image and k which are in the visible uh, range uh, here i'm plotting a uh, quiet sun in um, green the uh, dashed line uh, and some more uh, intense also quasi quiet sun which is from a data set that's close to uh, an active region where that's ultimately flaring. Uh, this is to show that uh, even if we have in uh, data sets a uh, region that seem quiet compared to the uh, crazy active region, it's, they're not true quiet sun. So if we compare the flaring spectra with the quiet sun in that same data set, it's, it may be biased because the quiet sun is not a true quiet sun, let's say. Um, okay, so the um, two lines have this particular uh, behavior, so uh, the wings come from above, and then it, it has it has two peaks and a central reversal, and the same is true for the H line, and this line corresponds to the transition from the first excited state of uh, the magnesium, um, the first the singularized magnesium to the ground state, so the blue line is the magnesium K, the red line red line is the H line. Uh, another other interesting lines, which are uh, because the difference, uh, energy difference between these two uh, levels and these two is very close. You also have the triplet lines of the magnesium, also in the same spectral range, which is in nice. Um, uh, so one of the triplet is in the blue wing of the magnesium, and the other two are seen as blended at the uh, iris spectral resolution in the bump between the two lines. Um, what uh, other naming conventions, the outer minima of the lines are called one, uh, K1 and K2, corresponding to the blue uh, to the blue word or violet word and red word minima. Uh, then they have the lines have two peaks called the K2, K2 peaks, and the central reversal is K3. Uh, what we are, we are interested in is see how this features change in different uh, different uh, atmospheric condition uh, which uh, how the and how their relation changes so in uh, quiescent in general or quiescent conditions we have you generally have a central reversal but if we are in in for instance in sunspot umbra we no longer have the central reversal and the core is also in uh, in emission so that it means that the formation height of the peaks and the central pole are very close together so the atmosphere is rather squished down um okay uh if we yeah yeah i'll have to check uh i don't know uh, I I know that uh, the the iris instrument thing has all the all the emission lines marked, but I'm not, I don't remember which one is which. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. No worries. Um, okay, so um, the different the magnesium forms throughout the whole chromosphere. The outer minima are formed close to the temperature minima above at the uh, in the high photosphere or the low chromosphere and as we go closer to the central reversal we are going higher in the atmosphere the k2 peaks are formed in the mid chromosphere and the k3 central reversal is generally formed very high in the chromosphere and the uh, again uh as i said before if there is no k3 central reversal that means that there's no much difference between where the peaks are or the minima form so we can scan if we scan okay so if we scan across the wavelength we can we are going higher in the atmosphere so if we start very low in uh, the lower boundary of the chromosphere let's say and then as you go higher up we see enhancement where the where there's magnetic activity or there's something so the intensity increases and as we go closer to the core of the line 
uh, we see a lot more filamentary structure where there's magnetic field, which is similar to what we expect high in the atmosphere, where also the H alpha line of form, which are very filamentary like in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. this, this. Yeah. So this is uh, the full slit. So the, uh, and this is the same uh, solar Y axis plotted in time. So we have at, at the top there's uh, something like a small active region thingy, and at the bottom is a, a smallish pore or something like that. So it's uh, so this is showing a slice, the slit evolving evolving in time, and I'm just scanning through the wavelength. But uh, if I let it play, there's a weird shift in when I'm when it's getting close to the peaks. This is because if I'm just l taking a standard sweep, I'm not considering that the line may be shifted from one frame to the other or from one position on, on the along the slate to the other. So this is why there's a weird shift, like we see, like there are some waves. Uh, in order to get rid of this, we would have to find the exact position of the central reverser the, and the peaks, and then that, that would give a better uh, height exploration, let's say. Um, so, uh, to analyze the data, first uh, I'm start I started looking at some quiescent conditions and I'm interested to see if I can find any relations in relation between the different observables So, and uh, if any of them show enhancement or something to show there's, there's a coronal hole in the data set. So in coronal emission, the coronal hole is very dark and obvious, but in, in chromosphere emission, you can kind of guess it's, it's there, but uh, this uh, kind of imaging has is not that narrow, so it contains uh, other also other emissions. So it may not be true that uh, what we see here, kind of like the coronal hole, is true chromospheric emission. Another interesting thing I was looking at is um, at the, at the photospheric level, the small-scale granulation f uh, organize themselves into larger-scale supergranular, uh, supergranular cells. The um, granular motions move the magnetic field around and concentrate it in the boundary of the supergranular cell, and this is what we see here. So uh, this is what you call a supergranular cell. In the center, there's no mu not much magnetic things happening, and there's a stronger magnetic field along the, around, the, around the boundary. In the um, chromosphere, uh, this is showing reversed scaling, so very dark is very bright. Um, in the regions overlaying the network field, net so the supergranular boundary is also called network, and the, the inside, the interior of the supergranular cell is internetwork. Uh, the network field is uh, where the network field is, the intensity is higher, which is expected because we have a lot more going on there. And I was look, uh, trying to see if I'm simply looking at the contrast between intergranular, internetwork, inter and network. If there's any difference in how this dip, uh, how this behave in different solar conditions. So for this, I picked uh, four data sets: one in pure quiet sun, where there's no nearby active region, no corona hole, no nothing. Uh, uh, then I get one that is near an active region where uh, this is a typical what we'll see when we have a, a flaring observation. We have um, the slit crossing close to an active region and far away, far away from it you can consider that it's quiet sun. Um, and then we chose two coronal hole data sets simply because one of them had a very nice interesting uh, magnetic field concentrations at the position of the slit, which is rare. And but it did not have did not observe the magnesium H line. The other one has a weaker fields and it's not uh, sit and stare. So we are very interesting to find sit and stare observation that are looking at the same thing uh, in time. So it, it's not so we are not looking at as, we are just looking at the evolution evolution of a single thing and not scanning different things. Uh, this last data set. Uh, is not sit and stare, but it has a very small, diff small step um, interval. So the 
the distance between the consecutive slip positions is very small, so it's quite kind of sitting there. Uh, but it's also not very close to the center, so we are interested. We are interested to see to uh, to limit any line of sight effects. We picked some data sets that are very close to the to the center and uh, have no pointing issues and have the same observing characteristics, so the same spectral resolution, the same uh, spatial resolution, and things like that. And what we try to have this exactly the same line list, but as I, as I said before, uh, this data set does not observe the H-line. Um, okay. uh, the dark line in the middle is the position of the slit, and along that line I marked what we uh, used further in the study to as uh, internetwork region in gre in green, the uh, network region in blue. Uh, this we try to have a similar underlying magnetic field for all of them, and then in red is the strongest magnetic field concentrations uh, concentration along that slit. Uh, this one is kind of close to the active region, so that may give some weird things. Um, uh, in addition to, uh, again, remove any biases from the actual timing of the observation, we converted the uh, data numbers after wavelength calibration. So as the iris instrument spins around the Earth, there may, some, may, there may be some remain, uh, remain, remaining uh, influence on the measured wavelength, so we also uh, removed that, and then converted the intensity in da from data numbers to physical units. And this is important because it takes into account if there's any difference in, in the exposure time, in the actual spectral resolution, or if the f for us the, uh, the data sets are not for exactly the same uh, Weaker. So there are some, uh, some uh, instrumental degradation that can affect the effective area of the detector. So that also takes into account. And the solid angle uh, takes into account the distance from Earth to the Sun, which may also get some uh, influence on the measured intensity. Um, after we have uh, converted the intensity to uh, physical units, we can uh, do a simple analysis, a moment analysis, where we don't look at the detailed characteristics of the profile, but to look at it as just uh, considering something like a Gaussian symmetry and look at the intensity of the core, which is simply the, s the area under the emission peaks. Uh, then uh, for each data set, we have uh, found the, po the average position of the central reversal, and that uh, we consider that as the reference wavelength for that data set, and measured all the other Doppler shifts compared to that reference wavelength. And this gives you the, the line of sight motions, so blue shift will give you uh, uh, material coming towards the observer, and red shift is material going away. And we all, all using also this met method, you can, you can find the width of the line. Uh, after computing this, we can find uh, plot maps of the of that observable, and I'm plotting here their evolution in time for the um, integrating the intensity, the Doppler shift, and line width for. Um, the different activity levels. So the top is internetwork, uh, middle is network, and the uh, bottom is enhanced network. And this is for the quiet, the pure quiet sun. Um, as it was expected, the intensity uh, of the uh, so the intensity is again the reverse scale, so very bright, very bright. It appears as dark, and it's again scaled to increase contrast using a cubic. Yeah. Uh, one zero point one six five arc seconds per pixel. Yeah, so zero three three something. Okay. Um, so as expected, the intensity increases with the increase in the underlying magnetic activity. And the same is true for the line widths, because as the intensity increases, so does the scatter inside the line. So we, as the intensity is higher, we also expect the line to be a little bit wider. Um, the Doppler shift shows the um, 
three million oscillations of the of the photospheric granula that can then uh, can go up even if to the low, to the chromosphere, but this uh, motion gets a little bit damped in the magnetic field where we see um, larger period of the oscillations. Uh, is the, f the is the f the center of the Gaussian approximation? Uh, we do this for all data sets, and what we I want to uh, mention is that in the where in the corona hole data set where there is a stronger magnetic field at the boundary of the, the network we can see a nice up uh, upflow and downflow corresponding to variation in the either we have an alternation of upflows and up downflows or we just have a variation of the line of sight component and it's not true motion, let's say. Um, another uh, interesting thing, that, um, but that may, that may be also just due to the data sets we, we obtain, the line weights in the coronal data, coronal uh, coronal sets are a little bit higher in the network, but that's a, maybe just due to the underlying magnetic field and not be a true characteristic of the coronal hole. Um, additionally, now we, con we want to find the exact position where, of where the emission peaks are and the absorption minima, the center reversal are. To do this, I used um, I developed a routine based on a C on CDF, so commutative distribution function of the spectra. So I take the commutative distribution function of whatever the profile is, and then find positions of 10, 25, 50, 75, and 90 percent, and consider that the line is fully contained between the 10 and 90 percent. So these are the two outer black lines. Uh, then, I, taking the position of the 50% CDF, I'm searching for a minima that is close to that position, and that should give you the position of the central reversal. Uh, after the, the central reversal is found, I'm looking for uh, peaks to the left and to the right, and those I consider those to be uh, the uh, emission peaks surrounding the central reversal. Uh, this works perfectly if the line has two emission peaks and one central reversal. Uh, if there are more peaks, uh, it will tend to choose the higher peak. And if the line is fully, it uh, does not have a central reversal, again, that will be uh, give crazy results. So for those cases, if there's no central reversal, I choose uh, the, posi the K3 position to be the 50% uh, location of the CDF, and the 25 and 75% are the K2 and K3. And those seem reasonable, but again, that may be but that uh, that may, in quite some data set that those kind of profiles are rather rare so this method works perfectly for if we are not looking at flares um another thing that can skew the result if we have just one peak that is extremely higher than the other and uh, then again that maybe give some weird results for that again i i choose the um, um position of the 50 percent for the central minima and then the try to find maxima to the left and right of it, but that not does not always work as intended. But again, that's more common if there's flaring, and for quiescent, that's rather rare. Um, if we have the pos these positions, we can again construct maps in that, that specific wavelength, so we get a better idea of the formation height of those uh, profile, pr those features in the profile. Uh, considering the um, this, this, this identifies positions, we can find how wide the peaks are separated by taking simply the difference of, of their positions in wavelength. Um, in general, uh, the two peaks are not, do not have the same height, and this uh, line asymmetry calculation gives you which of the peaks dominates, and this may give you an idea of if there's any uh, velocity gradients in the region where these lines are forming or above them. Uh, the depth of the core is calculated uh, taking into account how deep is the core compared to the surrounding uh, peaks and values that are close to one give you a very deep uh, core and uh, values close to zero give you a very shallow core and values lower than zero will mean that the, the core is in emission. 
and then we can compute if you do the same analysis for the H line, you can compute the ratio between the full line or specific uh, features of that line. Um, so to backstep a little, uh, these are the, the maps I told you about that I, we can construct the maps for the different spectral, pro uh, spectral features. In on the um, left is the uh, blue peak, the center reversal, the red peak, and the outer minima of, uh, for that observation. Um, it's interesting to note that in the uh, center reversal maps, the um, uh, fibrillar structure that we are familiar from H alpha is much more e obvious. That means that uh, k the K3 is very formed very, very high in the atmosphere. And this, uh, we can see this fibrillar structure even if in the K2 emission, but a little bit fainter. And it's because they form over a wider range of chromosphere, the um, uh, fibrillar structure is not that obvious. Um, and again, you can do the same thing for all the data sets. Uh, again, the fibrillar structure is much more clear if there's a, a more intense magnetic field. Oh, yeah. No. Uh, so the, the bottom one are coronal hole. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, taking the position so uh, the map, the maps are constructed for the position of the blue peak, the central reversal, and the red peak, and then for the, the outer minima, which is something I chose it as the, as being at at ninety percent of the emission of the CDF. Um, and for the coronal holes, again, in the in because its intensity, there's not much uh, contrast, uh, and the, uh, all the difference may be just due to un the underlying features and not. Uh, the uh, pure coronal hole signature. Um, but then we can look at the um, relation between the uh, profile features. So we, uh, I'm plotting here again. Ma uh, these are maps plotted in time for the slip uh, for the region of inter internetwork, network, and enhanced network for the quiet for the pure quiet sunset. Um, in the internetwork, we have a high um, a shallow uh, uh, emission core uh, cent or center reversal for the magnesium lines, and we, uh, and this the depth of the emission co emission core decreases as we are uh, pro going to higher magnetic field. Uh, this uh, while uh, in the same time the separation or how far apart the two peaks are increases from the quiet from the internet work to the enhanced network where we have very uh, high separation where there's uh, some magnetic field underlying it, and the same uh, the magnet the ratio between the H and K lines, the pure theoretical ratio in optical thin conditions is two to one. So we expect the K lines to be twice as bright as the H line, but that never happens on the sun. Uh, in the internet, where in general the average value for the sun is some 1.2 uh, for the ratio. Uh, for the internet work, we ha we obtain something like 1.1, and this ratio increases as we are go to higher magnet uh, to more intense magnetic field. Um, looking at all the data sets, uh, we found a curious things for the active region data set that what you chose as network may have been too close to the active region because it has a very weirdly a deep uh, magnesium profile and this may be due to the closeness to the active region so it may have some other uh, structures above it that may uh, absorb something from the emission core particularly. Um, in the coronal hole data sets uh, for the first coronal hole data set, we did not, as I said, we did not have the ops, the H line observed, so we don't have any ratio. But we do have a very nice uh, the um, dominance of the peaks gives a, a very nice contrast for where the outflows and outflows at the boundary of the network are taking place, and the contrast is much nicer than in the Doppler shift because it's a much uh, better way of identifying which is. Um, the overall uh, velocity gradient in the formation high, in for, formation region of that line. 
Uh, another thing. No, that's about it. Um, uh, we, to summarize this, we have done, uh, we have fitted the histogram of all the data, the particular, particular data sets and found uh, some average values for the intensity inside the region we consider as internet or network and enhanced network for the all data sets for the all observables. And as I said, as was clear from the uh, temporal maps, the intensity increases with the increase of the magnetic field, uh, as well as the line width, uh, the peak separation uh, also increases, the same as the ratio, and uh, the depth of the core decreases. To have a better, to see if there's any correlation between this, we have computed a cross-correlation matrix of all the observables, where we have each element is the pairwise correlation between the two observables. Uh, values close to one or very red are closely correlated. Values close to minus one or very bluish are anti-correlated and things that close to zero, it's non-correlated. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, so we computed the pairwise correlation between the observables, and as expected, the correlation between the different kinds of intensity of the peaks, the, ce the central reversal, the integrated intensity, and so forth, are very closely correlated as they came come from the same emitting plasma. So we'd expect them to be correlated. Uh, what we found interesting is that we found uh, anti-correlation between how wide the um, the, between the separation of the peaks and the um, uh, sh uh, line width, which, but again, it's not very very surprising because if the peaks are separate, are more separated, that would mean a very wide uh, wide profile. So that's not that's surprising. Um, another uh, anti correlation uh, uh, correlation is between the uh, width of the um, uh, line, uh, width of the, the distance between the peaks uh, and the, the how deep the center reversal is. So with, again, they seem to be uh, a little bit correlated. Um, there's an anti-correlation between the ratio of the peaks and the Doppler shift, uh, which uh, I guess just that if we have a overall blue shift in the line, uh, we we have material that is coming towards us. So the the blue peak will dominate that emission. So that's uh, how how we you, we explain this anti-correlation. Uh, the, again, there's an anti-correlation between uh, the intensity of the central reversals and how deep they are. Uh, but again, it's not a very strong correlation. And this only happens for the very enhanced network, the, co the correlation between the different um, observables is very low for internetwork. Almost there's almost no correlation with the magnetic field, but there's not much magnetic field there, and um, there are no strong correlations on the correlation except for the correlation between the actual intensities observed. Um, and this trend uh, is consistent through all the data set in, in the different quests and conditions. So again, there's uh, we could not find uh, definitive proof that coronal holes can be better seen in that particular observable. But uh, that may be due to the data sets we have and the small regions we took along the, the slits. So in the, uh, since I've been here, I started looking at full disk mosaics, also taking with iris. So our, uh, iris will take um, a very small portion of the sun and then move above it and so forth until it bit builds up a full disk uh, mosaic. This takes about 16 hours or so and um, it gives you all the information uh, to have a very 
to know how the sun looks like overall. And then if we take the same kind of analysis and apply it to this, we'll make sure that there's no observation uh, related biases meaning there's no variation in the position of the Earth with respect to the Sun or the, the instrumental degradation and things like that. But the resolution, the spectral resolution for the mosaics from the data set I've seen is a little bit lower than what I've used. So that maybe may also affect the results. What I did so far is identify the position of the K2 and K2, uh, K2 the position of the peaks and minima. And as in the integrated intensity, you don't see much except that where there's, there are active regions in the emission in the core, I can recover very nicely the um, filaments. And the filaments are close to the boundary of the coronal hole, but the coronal hole is somewhere, somewhere like here, so not very close. Uh, yeah, but if I'm taking, uh, if I'm looking at very complete, it's completely different data sets for years apart, the difference may be significant to affect the intensity a little bit. So in this kind of data sets, if it's all taken in within one day, so the, the, the distance does not change that much. And the instrument degradation does not change that much, except as if it ex explodes. Um, so I think this, I think that yes. Um, so the uh, each uh, piece of the mosaic is taken, and then when it's built up, it uh, arranges things to, so they over they make the full sun. So there's still some gaps between the different sets. So the sharp vertical or horizontal lines are not real. Things are just uh, the uh, when the Observing Quran was done, or there was not that was not complete overlap between the boundaries of the detectors. Oh, yeah. So even in this, if we uh, if we uh, on the laptop is better. If we squint a little bit, you can see a little bit. There's should be, there's something there, but uh, if you look just in the um, emission core, the, uh, the because it's formed higher, the uh, filament is much more obvious. And I also looked at the core depth again, which uh, uh, the filament pops up. And because maybe I'm just seeing things, the at the North Pole, there is the depth is a little bit higher, and there seems to be something there. But again, I'm I can't say for sure that it's not some artifact of the uh, analysis. So I have to look in more details on this one. So this is what I'm doing now. Uh, in the remaining time, I will discuss about how. Uh, the magnesium lines go crazy when there's flaring. So you maybe have seen this before. If um, <laughs> uh, if uh, um, active region motions and stuff like that can lead to some instability and some field lines get close together and are forced to reconnect. Part of the um, plasma and energy is sent out into space and some another part of the energy uh, is directed towards the uh, lower solar atmosphere. So the reconnection point is uh, usually in the uh, in the corona and the most of the energy dissipation happens in the chromosphere. So from the reconnection point the energy propagates along the foot points of along the field lines and depending on how strong the flavors, you can have a very uh, mellow evaporation where you see uh, we see things slowly um, heating up or increasing in brightness but if the flare is strong enough uh, when the energy uh, is accelerated toward the, at the low atmosphere and it uh, really kind of punches into the chromosphere and leads to some explosive um, evaporation. And this uh, evaporation uh, heats up and lifts some of the chromosphere material higher in the in the loops and then after that as they cool down you, you, they come back down. And this is what you see as the post flare loops when the material is cooling down and coming back to the lower atmosphere. So because I wanted to see the very intense differences in the um, observed uh, profiles, I picked the next class flare, 
and this is nice and not really because a lot of things can uh, get saturated if the um, emission is too strong, especially for instance in the AIA images, but which which are. So this is how the flare looks like in all the imaging uh, instruments that I found, uh, and I'm try I've tried to somehow somehow group them by how high they are. And so I'm starting from something like it that has photospheric contributions, and but these two also have some radiation region uh, contributions that become very obvious when it's, there's flaring. Uh, the iris, this um, um, maps the continuum the photosphere so when the uh, on the flare happens you can see only the floor ribbons nicely sweeping across the active region uh, penumbra and as you go higher up you see the filament that is bubbling up and then gets erupted and everything goes crazy the aia higher and ener higher energy or higher temperatures get saturated so you can do much with them um but ours is quite okay -ish. um in the spectral so uh, uh, this is the, um, in green is the region that Iris observes, the black lines are the position of the slits, the slits. so during this flare the Iris was observing in four step raster, so it has four slit position that repeats for a while. The contours are the position of the X-ray kernels, so where the, or where most of the energy deposition of the flare happened. Um, uh, this frame is a little bit after the flare, so you can see the ribbons. Uh, the southern one is f nicely across the. Yeah. Is this, the hard -ray? Uh, this is bo both. So this is the soft and uh, soft and hard X-ray, but it's integrated for a while, for a whole while. So that is not it's not very clear. Uh, if you integrate for a shorter pi period, you can see as, as the uh, foot point moves up with the ribbon. Um, so then the southern ribbon of the flare crosses nicely uh, the slits uh, and uh, we've chosen I w uh, what I present further on. I'm looking more mainly at the first exposition where the most intense things were happening. Um, in the outer red uh, image is the AIA 304, which shows nicely the filament that was uh, the culprit for this flare, which uh, slowly rose and erupted and uh, is untwisting as it goes. Um, the magnesium lines uh, are all over the, pl the place. In the dashed black line here is the quietest an average of the quietest regions of, of the spectra, which is not as uh, is very intense. So this is the same spectra as I showed at the beginning, which is very some four times higher than what we consider should consider quiet sun. And um, in colors are the spectra at the position of the flare maxima, so right above here in the first slit position, and uh, the colors indicate time. And the uh, black. Uh, cutoff line is the position is the flare maxima. Uh, the cut is just because the the spectrograph uh, sensor becomes saturated, so it's not much use for that particular time. And before the flare, we also even before the flare, we can see that the um, uh, t uh, triplet lines, which are here, are in emission which uh, is characteristic where there's strong temperature gradients and things happening, which is uh, what's happening in this case because we have, as you've seen, seen in the earlier movie, movie the, there's a lot of bubbling and brightenings happening even before the flare. So this indicates there's things happening well before the flare starts. As the flare progresses, the intensity increases, uh, the lines are wider and uh, eventually they saturate. After the flare, the intensity starts slowly to decrease, but be, uh, but continues to stay unusually uh, wide. Is this yeah. 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 So, uh, 
uh, to go into it a little bit la later. So this may be just, uh, we have, uh, there's a bubble of plasma that's at the position of a wave, but there's also something above that's moving crazily or coming down or something. Uh, but because we have very few spectra, we don't, can't do much. But uh, if we look at the full movie of the emission, stop doing that, of the emission in the, um, along the, the first slit position, this is the magnesium K line, this is magnesium H line, the triplets are here, and you see near the active region there's, they are in emission, but after the flare, we continue to see this, uh, so, uh, so the, f the filament gets erupted and accelerated up to some 300 kilometers per second away from the sun, but it's along the line of sight, as you and as you've seen in the AIA image, the filament is slightly to the side, so the actual speed of the filament eruption may be a lot higher than that. Um, so after the flare, we have in, uh, in continued emission in the red part of the spectra, which is a little bit weird, and I will discuss that a little bit later. And we found that to be some kind of coronal rain that lasts for a while. Um, so if you go back to this, uh, and we take some averages and the different, uh, dif for the different slits, we can find the different onset of the flare for the different slit positions. So this corresponds, uh, not all the way, all the loops are, are very nicely aligned along the slit, so some of them feel the uh, C plasma flowing or so, things from the, fl from the flare side uh, a little bit earlier than the first slit position. But if we look, this is the moment maps, at the position very, so this is just position from here to here, very small region. Uh, before the flare, we have some enhancements, uh, the position where the filament is, and af uh, after the flare, we can see nicely the southern ribbon with very high intensity. It's better seen in the Doppler shift, where it corresponds to plasma flows from the high atmosphere to the uh, chromosphere. Uh, before the flare, what's interesting, we have uh, some blue shifts corresponding to the filament, and this can be seen some half an hour, starting some half an hour before that, but uh, the, uh, for half an hour before the flare, it's not consistent. In the last 10 minutes, the blue shift is consistent, and it shows that the, f the filament starts to slowly rise uh, and becomes unstable and eventually erupts and produce, uh, uh, causes the reconnection of the flare. Uh, we're not sure which comes first, if the reconnection produces a filament or the other way around, because everything happens in a very short time frame and the cadence is not enough to see which is the first one. But uh, they, sh they should be related as the filament rise uh, causes the, uh, it's very close before the, fi the flare. Um, what I said before in the Spectra movie, we have this peculiar uh, long lasted rest shifted emission. Uh, when we have a flare, we generally expect to have the flare, the flare going off, and then in a few minutes, everything should be coming, should be calming down and going back to business as usual. But after the flare, in the region that was swept by the flare ribbons, you continue to have um, downflows of some 60, 70 kilometers per second and very wide uh, lines. So. Uh, first idea was that maybe we have we are dealing with some kind of coronal rain, but because it lasts for so long and the dopl the shifts of the line, the widths of the line are so large, we went into more details to see what could produce that. So again, this is the data. If you plot now uh, the um, position of the flare, what we consider the flare maxima, uh, this is time and this is the wavelength, this is the K line, and this is the H line, and this is the triplet. Um, um, and we get this nice, some kind of weird pine trees of um, emission. So the, after the flare, we have some six minutes of relaxation, and uh, we, are, we expect after the flare, there's the relaxation to continue and re uh, come back to preferred prefer conditions in less than half an hour or so. But we have an onset of very wide profiles, and to see better, we, I'm comparing here uh, a pre-flare uh, profile in the, this two, 
uh, and then I'm scaling down the post flare profiles to, uh, to have them in the same graph. And we see that we have emission both uh, the reference wavelength of the magnesium lines. Uh, so this is, uh, these are both, and they are both centered to the res respective reference wavelengths. So we have both emission at the reference wavelength, but also have some so this peak to the red. And this is the, the con contribution that gives you the, that, that large redshift. So the peak of the, this uh, component is at about 75 kilometers redward, and it's some 150 kilometers wide and lasts, as I showed before, for about an hour and a half. Uh, if you, again, this is plotted for the full, till the end of the data set, we see that this continues and maybe continues afterwards, but the data set was, was done. Yeah. So this is the triplet, the, the triplet yeah, that's a triplet. Uh, we'll go to that in a bit. So this is again. Uh, to, uh, we then also looked at the transition region lines, and we found the same uh, pine-like uh, structure, but it lasts a little bit. Uh, it's last a little bit uh, less. So that means that if uh, the whatever is emitting uh, either has dropped the, its temperature under the temperature needed to excite these lines, or that the resolution is not enough. Uh, or the sensitivity of the, sensitivity of the instrument is not enough to continue to see it for longer. Um, so here I'm comparing the integrated intensity for what you consider quiet sun in the data set, the pre-flare, uh, the well, for the impulsive flare, the relaxation phase, and the post the weird post flare profiles. In and compare and uh, the post flare intensity is. Uh, almost the same order of magnitude as the impulsive in the positive phase, because even if the intensity of all intensity is a little bit lower, the width of the line it's, means that there's, there's a lot of material emitting in that uh, wavelength. So what we are trying to explain is what's happening and. Uh, as I said before, we we think it's some kind of coronal rain. It uh, it's, uh, it starts some six minutes after the flare. It covers a small region. Uh, there's no surface reversal in the redshift component, so that means there's the uh, there's no much not much difference between the location where the key the peaks and the central emission is formed. Uh, we have a very smooth profile we are brought across the different uh, Doppler shifts, so we can't say that we have different bubbles of plasma oil going at different speeds, and but giving overall the same um, profile. But, we ha but the, if the motions are very small scale and under the detection limit of the instrument, you have the design resolved motion that can have the same effect. Yeah. after maximum flare, yeah. And this is an average value for all the different lines. In the magnesium line, it starts a little bit earlier than in the transition region lines. Um, the re uh, looking at the ratio, both of the H and K lines and uh, calls the carbon two, uh, we expect something like an optically thick plasma, but we will see if that's the case. And we're trying to explain why we have such a wide, sh wide profile and see if the magnetic field can play a role in that. So we constructed a simplistic model of the emitting uh, plasma. We consider a small strand with typical values which we took from literature. Uh, we need temperatures to be some 10 to the fourth K because for higher temperature, the magnesium gets further ionized, so it's no longer emitting. Um, and Again, considering some typical values for the flaring, flare energy, the, the quantity, quantity of material can, that can be ejected during the flare that you may expect to come down, to, maybe, or part of it to come down. Uh, we build a reference model considering this, and we try to explain why we have this large uh, unresolved motion. Uh, we first look at the line opacity and see if uh, any of um, 
if the any of the photons from the line core can ex can escape before being uh, absorbed or destructed. So we look at the destruction probability compared to the escape probability, and within our model. Uh, theoretical model, we get that the escape probability is much higher, so we expect uh, the um, land opacity to not be that high. Uh, and, the, and the difference in the ratio between the HK line may not be purely due to optical thickness, but due to the orientation of the plasma strand that you are, we are observing compared to our line of sight. So if you consider a very small cylinder and um, in general, the um, line opacity of uh, the K-line is twice that of the H-line. So uh, for, if for a simple cylinder, the K-line only sees a very small shell across the outer boundary of the cylinder, while the H-line maybe uh, we see deeper in. So that may give you the different, uh, the, give you the same ratio, but not necessarily need optically thickness. So if you consider this assumption that we have, an, we have an effectively thin emission, we can compute the expected intensity and we find 10 to the 7 ergs per centimeter square, blah, 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 blah which is very, the same order of magnitude with what we have measured in the data. So this is uh, nice. Uh, so again, if we, uh, for effectively thinness, we can compute the ratio between the intensity of the magnesium H and K lines and the, infra the tripith lines, and that gives you a better approximation of the temperature. So these values are times 10 to the 4th, 4 Kelvin. Um, as I said before, the Doppler shift it can be easily explained from literature by having just uh, some plasma uh, free falling uh, in the solar atmosphere and the values uh, for the coron for coronal rain value uh, range from 50 to 90 kilometers per second depending on the morphology of the loops that it's flowing in or through and to get this uh, velocity we need the plasma to get only up to some five uh, megameters above the uh, solar surface uh, so for the sudden onset and the line width, we can, uh, if we assume uh, that we have the um, small scale motion are purely due to some uh, alphanic motions, we can get we get the magnetic field of uh, we need a magnetic field of 17 go goes in the chromosphere, which is reasonable because the photosphere has two orders of magnitude higher magnetic field than that. So we suspect. Uh, so as the magnetic field decreases, it still can get. We can get this kind of value. So an alphanic energy, uh, an alphanic wave, uh, may be what we are seeing as for that those small scale motions, and uh, we. This is reasonable within the flaring energy because we only need a thousandth of the energy of the flare to go into exciting waves and entertaining the waves and uh, after the flare. Uh, so some final notes about this. Uh, from the magnesium emission, we can also find the um, total, total emission from the chromosphere because uh, the magnesium uh, two lines are some of the most main contributors to the radiative losses from the chromosphere together with the iron two lines. And we can get some estimation of the total uh, chromospheric energy losses during the in the aftermath of the flare, uh, due to this uh, post, uh, to this coronal rain phenomena, um, the slow because the um, line shift remains consistent, but the intensities and line widths decrease in time. We uh, think that uh, some the waves were excited during the um, impulsive phase of the flare, and they slowly convert their energy to some to heating by different either by phase mixing, mix, mixing resonant absorption or ion neutral collisions. Uh, a simple case of ion neutral collision, if you consider an alphanic wave with a period of uh, 10 seconds, uh, only uh, ion neutral collision will give you the needed uh, a dissipation time of about 2000 to 2500 seconds, which is uh, the same order of magnitude to what we observe for the duration of the event. It may be longer than that, but again, the observation ends. Um, so, this is uh, my summary. Um, the magnetic uh, two lines are very interesting to see what things, how things are changing inside the chromosphere, and their relation gives you information about uh, the 
structure and what's happening under in the underlying photosphere and in the case of flares you can also get some information on how energy gets propagated from the cor the coronal uh, reconnection site to the chromosphere um, and uh, for the coronal rain is um, it was interesting to see to go start from a, such a weird looking profile and uh, find a reasonable explanation for it even if it's maybe not the only one because we also looked at if uh, the electronic recombination can uh, send uh, photons that far away in the red wing, but uh, the, we found that it's some three or four orders of magnitude lower intensity that we expect, and we also looked if scattering or uh, polarization can have the same effect, but again, it's orders of magnitude of compared to what you observe. So this is the most reasonable uh, scenario we, can, we could find. And that's about it. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please feel free.